the shooting range. In this episode, the story of a new Italian SPG, also known as the Dachshund. How to use your suspension to get more frags. Hotline. The developers answer questions that you've left in the comments. But first, let's start with the PGH-2, the almost literal flying Dutch, uh, uh, American. In War Thunder, some ships not only sail, they also fly. Why don't we take a look at one such technological wonder? Lo and behold, the ultra-modern PGH-2 motor gunboat. To achieve unparalleled maneuverability and speed, the engineers decided to use hydrofoil technology in combination with the Boeing gas turbine engine. The earlier experimental version of the ship completed a couple of patrols and training exercises before receiving its baptism of fire in North Vietnam, where the PGH-2 proved itself to be more than effective. In the game, this fella sits at the battle rating of 3.3. It's practically the cream of the crop when it comes to torpedo and artillery boats. The PGH-2 is armed with the Bofus Mark I 40mm cannon, which is equally effective against both airborne and seafaring targets. Total ammunition load is 2,200 shells, 500 per magazine. An impressive number, no doubt. And you can sometimes get a bit trigger happy. But don't you ever get trigger crazy. The gun can overheat and subsequently jam. You also have an 81mm mortar with 100 shells at your disposal, as well as two twin-barrel 12.7mm machine guns. These handsome twins and their sibling, the Bofors, almost certainly guarantee that the enemy aviation will try its best to avoid your vessel. The gas turbine engine with hydrofoils allows you to reach a pretty decent speed. At 60 kph, the ship takes off the water's surface and continues to accelerate into the air, up to 91 kph in realistic battles and 106 in arcade. To put it bluntly, it's the highest speed possible at this battle rating. Even if you disregard the BR, the PGH-2 is still one of the fastest ships in the whole game. However, such breakneck mobility comes at the price of defense and uh, non-existent armor. Couple that with a minuscule crew of 13 sailors and uh, what do you get? That's right, everybody's favorite. Low survivability. Although, if you consider the speed, it's not entirely catastrophic. The PGH-2 is just very hard to shoot at, even if you really try. Yes, you'll have fires. A lot of fires, actually, but they will often occur in the hull exactly where most of inexperienced players will hit you. And there are only two things that can get under fire, fuel tanks and the engine. Almost everything vitally important rests on the deck. To summarize, the Americans created a truly brave warrior capable of obliterating lone enemy targets and effectively dealing with aviation. We strongly recommend you use the Bofors at any opportunity. Its universal belts allow you to butt heads with all of the ships at your battle rating. The mortar's caliber is daunting, but the ballistics are not pleasant. Think of the mortar as your last resort. And of course, don't rush into the crucible head-on. You won't survive for long under concentrated fire. However, if you keep your distance and constantly maneuver, the PGH-2 will realize its potential. With a small profile and high maneuverability, you can become an elusive assassin acting deep behind the enemy lines. Speed, maneuverability, unrelenting effectiveness, even in the harshest weather and perfect armaments, all of that together is a killing combination in the hands of an experienced commander. And now, the long-awaited return to Italy. In preparation to the release of the Update 1.85, 
We're talking about what Italy has created for land battles. All military tech historians more or less agree that the Italians are far better at creating cars rather than tanks. The cars are just better, give or take. Prettier, more elegant, more comfortable, and so on and so forth. This is completely true, by the way. Battle reports and statistics speak very persuasively. However, we want to play the devil's advocate for a bit and say something nice in defense of Italian armored vehicles. Engineers of the Ansaldo concern, which was responsible for manufacturing the majority of the heavy military tech in Italy, certainly were in touch with achievements of worldwide tank construction. But before the war broke out, they were focused on creating armored vehicles for the African theaters of war, and just in case, for the Balkan theater, where the landscape is complicated and the bridges are few and far between. The engineers were considering the much-needed possibility of transporting the vehicles by sea and deploying the troops without any local infrastructure. If you think about all of that, suddenly the Italian tanks step into a completely different spotlight. Would anyone dare to say that such tanks were not good enough to fight African Berbers, Ethiopian or Albanian armies? However, in a beautiful feat of irony, when the real war started in Europe, completely in spite of Italian war theorist predictions, it became clear that it's easier to satisfy the country's military needs by purchasing German and Czechoslovakian tanks. Since 1940, Italy had been converting their own vehicles into self-propelled cannons, thanks to some ingenious in-house developments. The Semovente 10525 M43 is considered their best creation. You can also call it the Basotto for short. That's Italian for Dachshund. Ansaldo created it in collaboration with Fiat. At 16 tons of weight, with a 190 horsepower engine, these beautiful bastards somehow managed to outfit such feeble chassis with a 105mm cannon with outstanding ballistics. This is, without a doubt, a marvel of engineering. This particular construction doesn't have any analogues, even to this day. Oh, and the height. It's almost microscopic. Only 175 centimeters. Despite that, the main advantage of the Basotto was its ability to quickly gain speed and retain its handling even on the sharpest of turns. It's the Ferrari of self-propelled cannons. The Basotto got into serial production in the spring of 1943, and by the time the Italian forces joined the Allies, the Ariete Brigade got its hands on the cannon. While being a part of the brigade, these Dachshunds saw action in the battles against the Germans near Rome. Understandably, the Germans were deeply fascinated with the cannon's design. In occupied Genoa, they restarted the manufacturing of these self-propelled cannons under the name of Sturmgeschutz M43 and managed to produce at least 60, according to some sources, 90 machines despite the nightmarish lack of resources. The Basottos probably caused a lot of problems to the Allies when they rapidly advanced in northern Italy and Germany. But much to our dismay, all documentary evidence of that is either destroyed or classified. Although it's worth mentioning that in 1945, the English were negotiating the purchase of the patent with Ansoldo's owners. This fact, even if by proxy, confidently proves that these machines were something truly out of the ordinary. Often find out that your enemy shoots first, even though you spotted him and not the other way around? Well, it's time to talk about using your tank suspension for your own good.
Most of World War II tanks don't have stabilized weapons, except maybe for the ones from overseas. They've got the single-plane stabilizers, shoulder support, and other useful things. Still, overall weapon stabilization became popular when the war had already been over. Taming a tank's suspension and making it help you shoot requires fighting on a given machine a lot. You need to learn its behavior, not only on flat roads, but also on all sorts of rough terrain. Of course, a machine without any stabilization tilts and swings when you try literally anything. It's not very nice, but you can make use of these conditions. For example, if your gun doesn't have great depression angles, you can abruptly hit reverse. Your suspension will make the weapon go under the allowed level for a second. You'll have to practice to catch this brief moment. Also, this might help you when your vertical drives break. If you use one machine for a significant amount of battles, you'll get used to these tilts and feel how much it actually helps widen your gun depression range. Mostly, this will be useful on maneuverable tanks like the T-34 and the T-44. By quickly moving forwards and backwards, you'll be able to profit from the additional elevation angles almost every time you fight. Now, what about shooting on the move? First of all, we don't recommend using brakes when spotting the enemy because, obviously, the hull will tilt forward along with the gun. Then the gunner will start aiming it up. Then the tank will return to horizontal position but the weapon now will be too high, and the gunner will aim down. Well, you get the idea. The weapon will go here and there a couple of times, and you'll spend one or two seconds to set it straight. And that's a huge waste of time in tank battles. Now, if you instead don't push the brakes, the tank will stop quite smoothly on its own without disturbing your aim. Also, we recommend minimizing those tilts by turning the turret sideways. Vertical swings will decrease dramatically. Of course, you will need to think of a slight deflection, but it'll be a lot easier than dealing with the tilts of the whole machine when the turret faces forward. And yes, you'll also need to plan your routes a bit more carefully to keep the turret where you want it. Remember, that suspensions aren't the same on different machines. For example, the Panthers and the French AMXs have suspensions that are great for moving and shooting at the same time, as their weapons are almost perfectly stabilized. Also, there's another thing that seriously affects your aim, and that is your speed. So, if you move relatively slowly, use the cruise control commands. Usually, it's Q and E buttons. To become a successful tank ace, you need to make the disadvantages of your machine work for you. It's not easy, but if you commit to it, any tank duel will be yours to win. And from then on, it's not very far from winning the whole battle. Get ready for the traditional last part of our show, Hotline. Developers answering questions from the comments. The first question comes from a user called Flanker16. Bruce, can you please voice a tank commander in-game? I'm afraid that's not entirely up to me, mate, but I wouldn't mind. Then there's another message coming from Hyacinth. What are your plans for 2019? Hi there. Well, this year we've introduced a lot of great things, and there is one more major update waiting for you before it ends. This time with the long-awaited Italian ground forces. So, as you might imagine, we're cooking a lot of new stuff for the next year as well. For example, there's still this little unfinished business with the World War mode, and the ships and helicopters for other nations, and who knows, maybe we will surprise you a couple of times. So stay tuned. Tank Steel 45 complains, 
23 episodes and still no chaffy. Hang on, mate. The shooting range to the rescue. Here's a picture of it specially for you. And more seriously, we'll talk about it sooner or later. And the last very serious message is from Snivy Films. I don't think Bruce is Batman. I think he's Chuck Norris. Because you don't find Chuck Norris. Chuck Norris finds you. Damn it. Mayday, mayday, they made me. Need extraction. Oh, wait, I'm Chuck Norris. I don't care. And that means... That's it for today. But feel free to write your questions in the comments below. We do read them all. And you might see some of them answered in the next episode. If you like what we're doing, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you on The Shooting Range.